Well, welcome to the second of our pandemic podcasts. I'm told it is Friday afternoon, 27th of March, although I think like a lot of people I'm starting to lose track of what day it is. And along with this podcast, there's a weekly newsletter going out to our church family with a sermon outline, some thoughts and questions for reflection and discussion. If you're not If you're listening in but you're not a regular part of the CBC Church family, then of course you are very welcome. And if you would like me to send you these outlines and study questions, you can look me up on Facebook, that's John Toller, uh, look up the church, or email pastor at carnoustiebaptistchurch.org. Now, as I said last week to our church family, I'd recommend listening to this and using the questions together at home where possible, uh, but also use them on the phone to discuss and pray together so the whole church family can be included. A couple of housekeeping matters, particularly for the church family. I'm exploring the possibility of holding a couple of live link services over the Easter weekend. Um, I'll probably use uh, Zoom, which is a free app and also available online. You may want to look into getting an, uh, getting that and getting an account with that. It is free, as I say. It'd also be great just for keeping in touch with folks uh, for video calls and things. And uh, also for those with kids, Marta's working on some material for them. I've also mentioned financial matters in the newsletter this week, partly in relation to church finance. If you're a regular part of the CBC family who normally gives via the weekly offering but you want to keep giving, then contact Gary, our treasurer. But we also know that there will be some within the church family, like many people around us, who are facing severe financial difficulties because of coronavirus. In the church we have our fellowship fund for such circumstances within our family. There's money available to help confidentially, uh, so please don't be embarrassed to ask. We may not be able to do everything, but we will help where we can. That leads us to our main topic for prayer today. The sermon in a few minutes will be thinking a lot about mercy, showing compassion to others, loving others because we love God. So many people and things we could pray for at the moment, and please do keep praying. Remember that the Baptist Union of Scotland have a Facebook Live prayer time, 7pm every Sunday evening during this crisis. But we're going to pray now and focus on some of those who are particularly vulnerable. So let's pray. Deuteronomy 32 says, For I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. Father God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you are pure and holy, that all your ways are just, that there is no iniquity, no darkness within you. And we thank you, Father, for how we experience that care in so many ways. Lord, we come to you as people who are often painfully aware of our own sinfulness. But we are also aware and thankful for our forgiveness. That in Jesus Christ we can have redemption. We can be set free. And Lord, we thank you that in any hardship in this life, That is still the case, that you love us, that you have set us free, that you have rescued us through Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you that nothing can take us away, that this is the greatest act of rescue, the greatest act of mercy and compassion the world has ever seen. But Lord, we also thank you that you still care about our lives here on earth. You're not just waiting for us to be with you in eternity. But you care for us. You know every hair that is on our head. And we thank you, Father, that you have shown through your word, through your church, through history, that you care for those who are vulnerable, those who are on the margins. We thank you that your word reminds us that you deliver the needy when he calls the poor and him who has no helper. 
that you have pity on the weak and the needy and save the lives of the needy. Thank you for this promise and this assurance. And Father, in light of this care that you show for the needy, for those who are in particularly difficult circumstances, we pray now, Lord, for them at this time with the pandemic going on and the enormous effects of that, not just the effects medically, but much wider and very deeply felt impact. We pray for families who are experiencing separation at very difficult times, Lord. We know that there are those who are unable to be with their loved ones in times of serious illness, to be with their loved ones as they are dying, but also, Lord, at times of joy, weddings that are cancelled, births where grandparents and other relatives may not be able to meet the child for quite some time. Lord, there are so many difficult situations that are thrown up in this time where families are having to be separated. And we pray, Lord, for these people. Lord, for those that we know personally, Lord, we ask that you would give them your peace. For those that know you, Lord, that they would trust in you and in your eternal purposes. For those that don't know you, Lord, that they would find some comfort. And particularly that we, your people, would be able to offer comfort and help in these times. We think as well of doctors and nurses who are at the front line of this, who are separated from their families. Some of them who have had to send children away for the duration and who are facing the agony of that. Others who are separated from their families because they simply cannot uh, go near them and who are having to live in hotels. And Lord, we recognise the enormous strain that this will put on many of these doctors and nurses. Lord, we recognise that in a time where they are feeling somewhat overwhelmed by the volume of work and we know this will only increase in the coming days, Lord, we ask that you would protect them, protect their mental health, enable them to find time to rest and relax. We thank you, Lord, for those who are seeking to help with that. But we pray again, particularly for Christian uh, doctors and nurses, Lord, we ask that you would help them to hold on to you, to keep their eyes fixed on you, and as they do so, to be able to offer hope to their colleagues and friends. Father, we also think of those who are at risk in other ways. We know there are so many in our community who are already isolated and very lonely, and this will only increase that sense for them. We think of those who experience abuse at home, for those who are trapped by poverty in very difficult living conditions. We think of the mentally ill. We think of children and their parents with autism and learning difficulties. Lord, all of these things add stress and strain. All of these things add anxiety, worry. Lord, we do pray that you would give grace in each of these circumstances. And again, Lord, may your church be able to offer hope, even from a distance, to support these people. And finally, Lord, we also pray for the financially vulnerable. Lord, we are told that we could be counting the cost of coronavirus for many years to come. Lord, we pray for those who have businesses that are being forced to shut down, for employees who are losing their jobs or losing income for the time being. We thank you for the help that has been offered to them by the government and other charities who are seeking to support. Lord, we know that our society needs to be uh, separated from its dependence upon 
material things and yet Lord we do not want to see people suffering we do not want to see people struggling to make ends meet and we pray Lord that the help we they need would be available we pray again Lord that anxieties would be settled we pray Father that you would provide and particularly again for Christians Lord provide for your people and enable your church also to offer support and care and love to those who are finding themselves at a loss at this time Lord help us also to be ready to offer the gospel it is not a, a trite offering for times of plenty Lord it is something that brings genuine hope real deep peace and joy in the most difficult of circumstances help us to have confidence in the gospel which is the power of God for those who believe and we thank you Lord that through the gospel we do look to Jesus we look to the one who has borne our sorrows by whose stripes we are healed who has given us that hope and peace we are reminded of those words of Paul. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. In his name we bring our prayers with thanksgiving to you. Amen. Well, we're going to read from Luke 6 together. Uh, to be honest, I had some doubts about whether I should just carry on in Luke's gospel through this pandemic or turn to something more obviously connected. But what could be more relevant to us than looking at the life and ministry of Jesus? It's not just that Jesus is always relevant in a general sense, but the detail, the specific circumstances, they speak to us so directly here and now. And that's really struck me again this week with this passage. So please read with me whatever version you have. I'll be reading from the ESV and we're going to read the first 11 verses of Luke chapter 6. So it's Luke 6. Verses 1 to 11. On a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, Jesus' disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those with him. And he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts. And he said to the man with the wither hand, Come, stand here. And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at them all, he said to him, Stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Father God, as we think about this passage, these words, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us, help us not to be those who sit and criticise the Pharisees without looking at our own hearts and our own lives. May your spirit work in us and through us as we read your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this passage raises some really interesting questions for us. 
We don't celebrate the Sabbath in the same way that the Jews did, but we still have a day set aside where we come together as God's people to worship. We come to devote ourselves to God's Word, to fellowship with one another, to the Lord's Supper, to prayer. But at the moment, we can't do these things in the same way. Most of it we can do in different ways. and Some of it we can't, like sharing the Lord's Supper together. That's an issue I've been thinking about quite a bit through the week. And I'm not convinced that it's something that we should do virtually, given the emphasis on the body of Christ, the church, in sharing it. But I wonder if rather we should ask God that the absence of this meal will deepen our hunger for the day when we will drink the fruit of the vine anew with our Saviour in our Father's kingdom. But our time of separation does raise questions. I think some churches are trying to do, and this is not a criticism, some churches are simply trying to carry on as normal, almost having the same sort of services uh, in a, in a virtual way as they would have in any other way on a Sunday. But I think it gives us an opportunity to question what we do, uh, to re-examine it. It doesn't mean that we will not go back to uh, our sort of usual patterns after this. But it does raise these questions. What What is it about what we do Sunday by Sunday that is important? What matters most to us? Is it the routines and the rituals that we are used to? Or is it the ways in which we love God and our neighbour and the ways in which that love is expressed through our Sunday gatherings? Now these things don't have to be in opposition. The routines and the rituals often help to grow our love but sadly we are prone to elevate them above love, to put a weight upon them that they cannot bear. And that's essentially the issue that Jesus is addressing here. He's not talking about how the Sabbath was observed. So we're not going to do that either. Although I will say one thing on this. Even in this period where we hardly know what day it is, I would say it is still important that we follow the pattern of rest that God has given us. But Jesus here is talking more about people's hearts. And the question applies now to us as it did to the Pharisees. Are we legalistic, self-righteous law keepers? Or are we lovers of God and our neighbour? Do we value tradition or mercy more highly? Let's look at these two incidents and see how Jesus addresses this. So in the first section... We have the Pharisees and the teachers of the law make another appearance. We've met them already. Luke has been showing increasingly how Jesus is seen as a threat to the established order. Jesus has authority. The religious elite don't like it because their position and power are being challenged. There had been issues with the Sabbath before. Back in chapter 4, Jesus had healed on a Sabbath. But it seems he wasn't quite on the radar at this point. And as Jesus' reputation spreads, these religious leaders, they come from all over the place to Capernaum to hear him. They're hoping to catch him out in some sin, and some heresy. They believe that he blasphemes by claiming divine authority to forgive sins. But they can't argue with his authority over sickness. They believe that he makes himself unclean by touching lepers and associating with tax collectors, but they have no answer to the authority of his word. They believe he encourages inappropriate happiness among his disciples, but they can see his authority over people's lives as he calls them to follow. Seeing his authority doesn't stop them looking for faults. You get this impression it's almost comical of these desperate men skulking around, peeping around the corners of houses and hiding in grain fields to see if he'll make some mistake they can accuse him with. And they are particularly keen to see what he does on the Sabbath. To Jews, Sabbath was hugely important. 
observance of the Sabbath marked someone out as a true, a faithful Jew. It also marked the whole nation out as unique. It was seen as key to relationship with God. It was based on creation, remembering that God had set out that pattern of rest at the very beginning. I heard a preacher once describe how a friend of his, who happened to be a NASA astronaut, gave him a lesson in cosmology. If you watch the sky for a while, you will establish the principle of a day. The sun rises, sun sets, sun rises again and so on. If you keep watching, you'll begin to understand what a month is. You have the cycle of the moon. If you keep watching, eventually you'll understand the principle of a year. You have the position of the sun and stars, the moon in the sky, and the effect it has on the earth and the seasons. But you could watch the sky for eternity, and you would never see the principle of a week. It is a pattern for human life and for our care for the earth itself, a pattern established by God for our good. So the Jews valued it greatly, but they also began to miss the point. What was supposed to be a day of rest became a huge burden. Over time they added rule after rule to clarify exactly what constituted work on the Sabbath. It was reminding me of what we have just gone through. The government call for social distancing, but as time goes on and we either don't fully understand what that means or simply don't follow it, more and more specific detail is added to the instruction. Now, of course, for us that's proved necessary. But with the Sabbath, it meant there was no longer any real rest. Because all they had was this constant pressure to stick to the thousands of rules. Everything you wanted to do or thought of on the Sabbath, you had to stop and think, is this lawful? And if you broke those rules, you might as well have said you were no longer a Jew. Well, on this occasion in Luke 6, the religious leaders would have ticked at least four boxes on their Sabbath transgressor checklist. The disciples pick grain, they're harvesting. They rub those grains in their hands to separate and dispose of the chaff. They are threshing and winnowing. They eat the grain, so it's food preparation. Now, of course, none of this is specified in scripture, but it's all in the Mishnah, the rabbinic traditions which were given the weight of law. Jesus himself doesn't do it, but as or at least it doesn't seem that he does. But as the rabbi, he should be making sure his disciples behave lawfully. We've got you bang to rights, they say. Why are you breaking the Sabbath? Now, as was so often the case, Jesus' answer is not what anyone would have expected. He takes a peculiar incident from David's life. David was fleeing from Saul and went into the tabernacle with his men. They were famished. And the only bread there was the bread that was replaced every Sabbath and was only to be eaten by the priests. It was bread that represented Israel's dependence on God as the source of their strength, their provision, the source of everything. It was effectively sacred, holy. And once he had established that the men were ritually pure, the high priest gave David this holy bread. Now, Jesus is not giving himself an excuse for his behaviour. He is claiming precedent. It's, uh, these days we would see it as a, a legal process. Uh, then it was a, a, a suitable one for rabbis to appeal to the precedent of scripture. He's also inviting comparison with his situation and David's. And the core issue is this. As one writer put it, human need must not be subjected to cold legalism. Jesus isn't entering into an argument about the finer points of what is or is not permissible. 
He's not trying to get the Pharisees to take a gentler approach, to ease off on their regulations. He's telling them to change their attitude completely towards both God and people. Now there's a really interesting addition in Matthew's account of this incident, which I think is worth mentioning. Uh, Luke doesn't refer to it directly, but it is very much part of the message he's communicating. If we take a step back, uh, when Matthew, who of course was also known as Levi, when he wrote of his own call by Jesus, he recorded Jesus quoting from Hosea, Hosea 6 verse 6. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Now that account is in Matthew chapter 9. Then in Matthew chapter 12, he recounts this episode we've just read. But he includes the same quote from Hosea. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. So Luke takes these two incidents and he puts them pretty much side by side. And even without the quote from Hosea, he's clearly making the same connection. The whole verse in Hosea says this, For I desire steadfast love, which is mercy in the Greek Old Testament. I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And if you go back into the, the original language of Hosea, into the Hebrew, the word for mercy or steadfast love is hesed, loving kindness. It's a word that's usually used to describe God's faithful covenant love for his people. And very occasionally it's used to describe acts of remarkable mercy and compassion shown by one person or group to another. It's very rare for it to be used as a command. It's used a couple of times in that way by Hosea, also in that famous verse in Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness, he said, and to walk humbly with your God? See, God's concern is not so much for external rituals and traditions, however honourable their intentions or their origins, but his concern is for lives that are full of love, love towards God and other people, particularly the poor, marginalised, the vulnerable. That mercy is shown in care for their eternal future. We see that in the calling of Levi, of Matthew. But it's also shown in care for their welfare, as we see here and in the next episode in Luke 6. It's the expression of the two greatest commandments. That we love God with heart, soul, mind and strength. And from that first love, that we love our neighbours as ourselves. In this case, Jesus says that what has happened is no different from David and his men breaking the law and taking and eating the sacred bread. Mercy, compassion, it was allowed to take precedence there. And Jesus argues that it should also be taking precedence here. The Pharisees put rules first, people second. Jesus says that in a very important way, they've got it the wrong way round. Their type of Sabbath is the wrong type of Sabbath. At the end of chapter 5 he spoke about needing to put aside the old for the new things of God's kingdom, of the gospel. And their Sabbath traditions are a pretty good place to start. And Jesus then tells them what his authority is for making such a change. He says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now this is an absolutely astonishing statement. Jesus is claiming authority over a God-given institution, over something that God himself put in place since creation. He says he has authority to define what it is and what it looks like. Its meaning can only be fully understood in him. We'll think a little more of the implications of that later. Of course, David's just referred to, sorry, Jesus has just referred to David. For Jews, David is the ultimate Messiah prototype. He's making his point. David didn't try to redefine the law, he just ate the sacred bread. He could override the law without blame in such circumstances. And Jesus goes so much further. 
He claims authority over the law, over the Sabbath. I think we can say that Jesus is doing much more than claiming to be the royal son of David, this messy, the, the Messiah. Once again, when we look at the implications of what Jesus says, he is claiming to be God. Well, on that bombshell, Luke moves on to another Sabbath controversy. Jesus is teaching in a synagogue. It's a synagogue on the Sabbath. You might expect religious leaders to be there, but this is no normal Sabbath meeting. It seems that the religious leaders have once again gathered in numbers. It was reminding me of post-war America and the uh, Un-American Activities Committee scouring society for communists, looking for reds under the bed, waiting for somebody to slip up by saying the wrong thing. And you get the impression that these religious leaders are pretty much following Jesus everywhere, waiting for him to slip up. He's there in the synagogue teaching. He's teaching from God's word. But they have absolutely no interest in what he's teaching. I think it demonstrates how much they really care about the word of God that they claim to love and uphold. All they want is, as Luke says, to find a reason to accuse him. And on this particular Sabbath, an opportunity presents itself. There's a man there with a withered hand, perhaps some sort of muscular dystrophy. And they're thinking, what is Jesus going to do with him? Well, first off, Jesus knows their thoughts. Just like he did in the house with the man who came through the roof. He sees through that veneer of respectable spirituality. He knows they're not in the synagogue to learn from God's word. He understands that they are looking for opportunities to get rid of him. Just as the written word of God is said to expose the thoughts and attitudes of our hearts, well, so the incarnate word of God exposes their thoughts and attitudes. Jesus calls the man to stand in front of everyone. He's almost asking him to expose his disability. It's a significant disability. It's his right hand. So in people's eyes, this would exclude him from employment and from any sort of social respectability. In a sense, he's asking the man to display an act of faith simply by stepping forward in front of these people. And Jesus heals him. The religious leaders, they can't argue with Jesus' words or his actions. They, they can see the result before him. We see... Also, that Jesus has indeed exposed the thoughts and attitudes of their hearts because their response is to be filled with fury, filled with blind rage. They're beside themselves with anger and they discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Matthew tells us that they actually began to plot Jesus' death. I think we can see here something of the conflict that Jesus spoke about at the end of chapter 5. The gospel is not a pick and mix counter. We cannot choose the bits we like and try to add them to the life we already live. We cannot have both at the same time. To embrace the new, we must die to the old. That is repentance. If we try to have both at the same time, well sooner or later we'll end up in the same position as these religious leaders. The gospel will challenge something we hold dear in our old godless life. And if we do not respond with repentance, leaving that behind, we'll find ourselves standing against the word of God. Perhaps using it to justify ourselves or simply no longer listening. So will we try to assert our own authority or will we submit to God's authority? Well, there in the synagogue, Jesus addressed the religious leaders with a question in verse 9. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or do harm? To save life or destroy it? He's addressing this issue of mercy once again. Is it more important to uphold ritual and tradition or to love God and your neighbour? The religious leaders may have been thinking that there was a third way. 
by not healing the man, not actively doing good, they may have thought, well, Jesus is not necessarily doing harm. We already have provision. Regulations can be overruled in life-threatening situations, but this is not a life-threatening situation. Why didn't Jesus just arrange to meet the man and heal him the following day? After all, he didn't heal every single person he came into contact with, so did it really matter if this man had to wait a bit longer? Well, Jesus shows them that acts of mercy are not just permissible on the Sabbath, they're commanded. He shows them that to do, to refuse to do good is to contribute to or to do evil. We use the term sins of omission as well as sins of commission. Not doing what is right is just as bad as doing what is wrong. Now, as we've said, Jesus didn't heal everyone he came across, and yet he didn't sin. He always acted in accordance with God's will. When people came specifically seeking healing, he didn't turn them away. When mercy was required, he showed mercy. And his people are called to do the same. And so the second part of his question, I think, was directed more at the religious leaders themselves. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to save life or destroy it? It's not just about that act of mercy in healing this man's hand. There's questions of spiritual mercy. We've already spoken about those two aspects, about both the meeting people's physical needs they're thinking about their welfare their well-being here and now but there's also the eternal the spiritual aspect of it are these people willing to see lives saved or are they happy for the sake of their sabbath regulations to see people remaining cut off from god but it's also much more pointedly directed to them. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to save life or destroy it? They would have said to save life and yet they were full of hate towards Jesus because of the challenge that he posed to them. And even on that Sabbath they were plotting his destruction. Well, let's return to that bombshell in verse 5. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus has authority to define what the Sabbath means. And this second episode underlines it. He looks around at them. They have no answer to him. And he heals the man. He is saying, I am Lord of the Sabbath. I am Lord in this situation. The Pharisees were concerned with rules, with externals. Jesus concerned with mer was concerned with mercy and with the heart. And those religious leaders' hearts were not full of love for God and others. They were empty of mercy and full of hatred. And in demonstrating his lordship over the Sabbath, Jesus points to the fact that true faith produces mercy. There are boundless examples in history, in education, in healthcare, the end of the slave trade and so many others. There are also firm warnings in scripture as well as the Old Testament examples mentioned earlier. Both John in his first letter and James write about how loving works are evidence that faith is real, is alive. If we show no mercy, no compassion to our neighbour... How can we claim to love God? How can we claim to have Christ in us? It isn't easy to do it. It requires self-sacrifice and effort and discomfort to show mercy. As this episode shows, it may get negative reactions. Consider this quote, which is with the questions in the newsletter. Dynamic mercy in all its dimensions is nothing less than the life of Christ in us. Such a life is costly. It is inconvenient. It raises tension. It brings conflict. 
it is humbling, it is countercultural, but it is our calling. It's tough. But remember that by his divine power, God has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. As we recognise that we have received mercy through Jesus Christ, and as we ask God's grace to extend that mercy to others, he will answer our prayer. Well, finally, when Jesus calls himself Lord of the Sabbath, he's not just claiming authority to define Sabbath. It also means he's the one who fulfills the Sabbath. Everything the Sabbath is meant to do, everything it is about, is found in him. It's worth looking up the word Sabbath in the Old Testament. You can use a concordance or use a, a Bible program online, something like Bible Gateway. Look up the word Sabbath, look up ideas like the idea of Jubilee and the Sabbath for the land. What does it actually mean? Think about what Sabbath represents. What is it meant to achieve? It's about peace and rest. It's about restoration. It's about communion with God and his people. And Jesus' Sabbath acts of mercy, they achieve these things in different ways. They point to the reality that it all finds its meaning in him. Which leads to one final question for us. Does our understanding of Sabbath, not in the Jewish sense, but our time of rest, of gathering together with God's people around the word, the Lord's Supper, and to praise him, does this reflect God's priorities? Does it communicate a legalistic view that is most, most concerned with doing the right things and avoiding the wrong on certain days? Or does it communicate the fact that we are God's people who have already entered his rest, who already enjoy communion with God and who look forward to eternal rest with him? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that in the gospel we are offered Sabbath rest. We are offered a rest that sustains us through difficult situations in this life and a rest that is promised for eternity. Lord, we thank you that it is your mercy that gives us this rest. It is your mercy that enables us to see what Sabbath is all about, what it points to. And it is as we receive and rejoice in your mercy, we are able to extend that mercy to others. So Father, as your people, shape us, we pray. Lord, whether it is specifically on a, a Sunday or whenever we are gathering together with one another, or whether it is simply in our everyday lives as we seek to walk in that perpetual Sabbath rest. Lord, let us be a people who display your mercy to others and who declare the gospel of peace and rest in Jesus Christ. And now may the Lord make our love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else. May he strengthen our hearts so that we will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Amen.